Call me crazy, but I sometimes get the feeling that this world is fake. In fact, I'll let you in on a little secret. I know it is. What an odd thing to say, right? I know, but it's true. I didn't come by this information all at once. At first the signs were so small, but I missed them entirely. It's only as I look back on now that I'm able to put all the pieces together, even the obscure ones. I started noticing little changes at first, but I was always able to laugh them off as explainable. That's what they were hoping for. They wanted me to miss those first few clues. They needed to buy as much time as they could to get a good foothold in this world. As time progressed, I could feel their eyes on me, watching to see how far they could go, to see if I would become aware as those changes became more frequent, more significant. I noticed, but like any normal person, I didn't believe it. I didn't want to believe it. I can see it in your face. The doubt... Doubt is much easier than conviction, isn't it? Belief takes effort. But indulge me. Let me see if I can make you believe. Let's see if you're brave enough to believe. It all started about the time I ran into Seton. I mean that literally. The coffee shop was so packed there was barely standing room. I bumped into him, spilling his cappuccino down the front of his shirt. Being the decent guy I am, I apologized and offered to buy him a fresh one. This got us talking. He said his name was Marcus Seaton. We seemed to hit it off like we were old friends rather than strangers. In some ways, we have so much in common that we're exactly alike. We both love the Baltimore Orioles, Nostalgia, and the Beatles, and many of the same TV programs. We both hate the current politicians of the same sports teams and crowded coffee shops. Yet, in other ways, we're complete opposites, which is what makes him interesting to me. While I believe in God, country, family, and the good in people, he is a profound pessimist, atheist, and loner. Seton seems to have a dark side that I don't possess. His broodiness makes him seem like a character in a Hollywood film. There's a romantic, dramatic attribute that makes him seem bigger than life. I wish I were like that. But I'm so basic and simple, I'm a strictly what you see is what you get kind of guy. I guess that's why I like hanging out with him. Some silly form of hero worship. I find it strange that even though I have lived in this town for about a decade now, we never met before now, and yet once we did meet, it seemed as we were constantly running into each other. I guess our friendship was destined to happen, which is why we didn't just meet that one time in the coffee shop, and then never again after that. It was Seton that started pointing out the oddball changes in the world, in the ways that the world just wasn't quite right. When I began to notice these subtle differences, too, and tried to laugh them off, it was Seton that kept shooting down my logic. There was no logical explanation for a world that was slowly turning upside down and inside out. By the end of that first year, there was simply no denying it. Call me crazy if you want, but I tell you, the world in which we knew was slowly being replaced by something. Well, something else. Could I tell you what? No. Could I tell you if it was being done by our military enemies, the scientific community, aliens from space? No. Not at that time. Now that I'd become aware, now that I was convinced, I wanted answers. That's when they targeted me. They knew I knew. They knew I was investigating them. Things got ugly. Once, when Seton and I were in the library doing research, they tried to stop us. The librarian kept shushing me, even though I told her it wasn't me. It was Seton. He has a bad hearing from an old war injury. He can get loud and forget to use his inner voice. 
As we opened the first book, we were shocked at what we saw. No words. Just 872 blank pages. Front and back. So we looked at the next one. Same thing. Then the next, and the next, one after another. This was a library full of wordless books. Naturally, we may have gotten a little loud after this nightmare discovery. The librarian didn't believe me. She just looked at me like I was crazy and had us both put out of the library. Now, after the fact, I can see that she was one of them. When we were in the movie theater, they kicked us out for being disruptive. As we were escorted up to the aisle door, I could feel every person's eyes on me. It was humiliating. As I turned to look at the movie audience, I screamed in horror at what I saw. No mouths. I saw their faces, the faces that appeared normal and human in every way, but none of them had mouths. Dear God, what were they? Were they the enemy? Was this them? Because they knew I was about to expose them and ruin all of their demonic plans for humanity, whatever that might be, they had to gag me. They could no longer control me. I was becoming a very real threat to them. They had to find a way to shut me up. So, they had me watched. Followed. The end was drawing near for one of us. I had to be the victor in this battle. There was too much at stake. It was just past midnight the first time they got their hands on us. Seton and I were out having a couple of beers. We were nowhere near drunk and disorderly as the cops claimed when they hauled us in. Sitting in the back of the squad car, Seton and I were in a foul mood and kept blaming each other for the serious turn of events. After all, until we met, we both had spotless criminal records. It turned out to be a minor inconvenience. They didn't keep us. They didn't even book us. No fingerprints, no mugshots. I was close enough to one of the cops that I heard them quietly speaking to the other about his honorable discharge from the military. And something about an old war injury to the head. They had access to Seton's old military records and could see that he was a good guy. Thank you, Seton. That was another way that we were alike. We both served in the army, but I didn't have any injuries like Seton. I'm just not dramatic enough to carry around any scars like him. This old head injury was what caused his hearing difficulties. Now, this was one of the bigger signs that I missed. They had mouths and looked normal. I didn't realize that they were the enemy, that they could change their appearance at will. What they were truing was trying to simply send me a message about keeping my mouth shut. I continued to investigate them, to get to the bottom of this mystery. The next time wasn't just an inconvenience, it was like something out of a nightmare. Just an hour before dark, Seton and I were driving home when this jerk cuts me off. If not for my sharp reflexes, we would have all been killed. I pulled up to him at the next stoplight to flip him off, but when Seton and I looked over into the next car, we saw two guys looking back at us. They would have been wearing evil grins if they had mouths. It was them. Or a pair of them. They were determined to shut us up, even if it meant murder. As they sped up, I had to chase them. I told Seton to get the license plate number as soon as I was in range, but they were too fast for us. 60 miles an hour, 70, 80, 90. Then came the flashing blue lights. It was just a traffic ticket for speeding, but our enemies got away. Now we would never know the identity of our would-be assassins. The cop looked normal. Real. But how could I be sure of anything anymore? 
Then came this third and last time. Strangely enough, even though it was the most recent event, I have very little memory of what occurred. To this day, I still can't remember being hauled off to jail as Seton thinks they drugged me. This was when I found the biggest piece of our puzzle. This time, for the first time, they actually booked me. They were going to take me before the judge in the morning. As they walked me through a tiny back hallway, there were pictures of a few U.S. presidents, George Washington, Abe Lincoln, JFK, their smiling, normal faces. <laughs> Next came a series of Supreme Court judges, all unknown to me, so I read the name plaque under each one as we walked slowly along. The portraits of the last three didn't have mouths. The last three were them. And I wondered how long this had been going on. You'll be happy to know that the man currently in the Oval Office is as red-blooded are you as I. We passed a cop, sitting at a back desk covered with files. He seemed behind in his work. They had me stand by him to wait as they prepared the camera for my mugshot. I watched as he thumbed through two stacks of files on his desk. The one on the right were criminal records belonging to regular Joes like me, profiles with mugshots and fingerprints. But all of the files on the left held photos of mouthless criminals, where the fingerprints should have been, I can only describe as a suction-looking tip. Having no memory of being hauled in, I was racking my brain trying to remember if I was with Seton or alone. I hoped they would put us in the same cell if they'd been brought in together. Suddenly, my memory ends right there. I think Seton is right. They must have drugged me. I just woke up in my cell some time later. How long had I been out? After several more blackout periods, I was brought before the judge. No Seton. He was nowhere to be seen. Just me. I had a hard time following what my court-appointed attorney or the prosecutor were saying. Somehow, I had lost more time than I thought. This wasn't some small-time judge. I was in an actual criminal trial. I have no idea what I was being accused of. The language they were using was my native tongue, so how come I was able to understand only their words and not the complete sentence? complete concept. Nothing made sense to me anymore. They had done it. They had drugged me so much that they must have fried my brains. And now here I sit, barefoot on the floor of this very white room, hugging myself with strapped down arms. They finally found a way to shut me up. When trying to kill me didn't work, they simply made me invisible. Unreliable, undesirable, unbelievable. Seton is in here with me. He pops in from time to time to keep me company. Now what is that to look for? Don't feel sorry for me. It's you. I feel sorry for you because your time is almost up. I'm sorry. I'm sorry I failed all humanity, but I somehow know that by this time tomorrow the human race will no longer exist. That's why I say this world is a complete fake, a counterfeit. The real world is being dissolved day by day, and the process is almost complete. Now, here comes the orderly. It must be time for my meds. You can call me crazy. Everyone else does. <laughs> <laughs>